I'm Alex Grant, and this is the Law of the Case podcast for February 26, 2024. Now, everybody wants to be able to express themselves, and one thing you know as an American is that you have the right to do so, and almost everyone knows that it is the First Amendment that gives you that right. Is probably the most popular part of the Constitution. Folks know about the First Amendment, maybe the Second Amendment, and its very contested right to bear arms, and maybe the Fourth Amendment protecting you from unreasonable searches and seizures, and probably the Fifth Amendment, which gives you the right to remain silent. After that, it gets a little murky. But the one thing you know even if you spent most of your time in civics class passing notes or texting on your phone, is that you know that the First Amendment protects your right to free speech. So why do so many people feel that they can't say what they want? You don't get to say anything you want on Facebook, and some people have complained about being barred and getting put in what they call Facebook jail. Likewise, on YouTube and other big platforms. You all know that. But did you know that the reason why you can't say anything you want on Facebook, YouTube, and other social media apps is the First Amendment? That much was clear from the Supreme Court arguments today about a Florida law that attempts to prevent censorship by private companies on the Internet. I'm Alex Grant with the Law of the Case podcast to help you make sense of why the First Amendment both protects your right to free speech and also prevents your right to say what you want in many of the places you want to say it. I spent 23 years in the Department of Justice prosecuting nearly every type of criminal case the department handles, and I'm currently an adjunct faculty member with the Western New England University School of Law. I am here to give you the straight scoop on the law, and I am unafraid to tell you when the emperor has no clothes. This podcast will cover the legal issues that journalists miss because they have never stood up in a courtroom, and I explain the law without carrying the water for either political party. Now, the key idea here is state action. Generally speaking, the Constitution applies to what the state, the government does. That means local governments, states, and the federal government. So the First Amendment has developed to greatly restrict the government from censoring speech. Now, that gives us a freedom of speech that is probably greater than anywhere in the world, the maximum. Other countries, like countries in Europe or Canada, have pretty open debate, but certain speech is not allowed that would be allowed in the United States, like denying the existence of the Holocaust. The First Amendment has been interpreted to mean that the government can't censor based on viewpoint. And things like parades and dances are even protected when they don't literally involve speaking. They are protected because people are expressing themselves. It protects people who engage in adult pornography because that's expressive too. It even protects commercial speech like advertising. So the First Amendment has done a pretty good job of restraining the government from stopping you from saying what you want. So what does that mean? You can stand on a soapbox in a public place and speak your truth. If you go to the area across from the White House, for example, which is a highly regulated and protected place, you will see all manner of people preaching all kinds of wacky theories, and that's allowed. But is that speech effective? What is the audience for that speech? How much does that speech influence people? Now, before the internet, you needed a platform a newspaper, a magazine, or television, so you could actually be heard in a meaningful way. With the internet and social media companies, 
ordinary people can create a viral moment and that message can spread. Or they can create their own platform on a place like Facebook or YouTube. But what happens when Facebook or YouTube have terms of service and rules of their own that limit what people can say, like denying the effectiveness of COVID vaccines or banning someone like Alex Jones, who has accused the Sandy Hook parents of lying about their kids being massacred or banning Donald Trump? Or what about your neighbor spreading lies about you, saying that you are a pedophile and stole money from the Girl Scouts? The First Amendment generally applies to the government, not to companies. And so they can uh, limit that stuff. So Florida and Texas have passed laws trying to prevent censorship by big technology firms. These two states were clearly trying to stop what they saw as discrimination against conservative voices, trying to prevent a company from banning someone like Donald Trump from speaking. Now, here's how Florida's lawyer in the Supreme Court described what the law was trying to achieve. Internet platforms today control the way millions of Americans communicate with each other and with the world. The platforms achieved that success by marketing themselves as neutral forums for free speech. Now that they host the communications of billions of users, they sing a very different tune. They now say that they are, in fact, editors of their user speech, rather like a newspaper. They contend that they possess a broad First Amendment right to censor anything they host on their sites, even when doing so contradicts their own representations to consumers. But the design of the First Amendment is to prevent the suppression of speech, not to enable it. So in response to this Florida law, the big technology companies got together and ran into court to prevent the law from being enforced through a preliminary injunction, which is a temporary measure the court can take to, in this case, preserve the status quo to prevent the law from taking effect before the parties spend months and years trying to litigate the case to final judgment. And the trial court granted the preliminary injunction. The Supreme Court arguments today, and you just heard a little excerpt of the Florida lawyer describing the law, these arguments were to decide whether that preliminary injunction should stay in place. So why was the trial court persuaded to issue this preliminary injunction? Well, because the law, which was meant to open up what can be said on these platforms, actually violated the First First Amendment rights of the companies. So that is what I mean. The First Amendment is protecting the right of Facebook to shut you down. Doesn't that seem backwards from a common sense point of view? It's like we had to stifle free speech in order to preserve it. Now, here's how Justice Kagan described what a Facebook or a similar site would want to do to police its site. For the most part, all these places say we're open for business. Post whatever you like and we'll host it. But there are exceptions to that. And uh, clearly content-based exceptions, which the companies take seriously. So let's say they say there we think that misinformation of particular kinds is extremely damaging to society. So that means keeping out Nazi propaganda, if it wants, or vaccine denialism, if it wants. Facebook, whether by human or by algorithm, is making millions and billions of choices about what you see and what you don't see. Kind of like a newspaper is making editorial decisions about what is worthy and what is not worthy to be put on its pages. So for Justice Kagan, these choices bring in the First Amendment. We are serious about those content-based restrictions, all right? So in that world, why isn't that, uh, you know, a a classic First Amendment violation 
for the state to come in and say we're not going to allow you to enforce those sorts of restrictions, uh, even though, you know, you're basically — it's like an editorial judgment. You're excluding particular kinds of speech. So Facebook has a First Amendment right to make editorial judgments about what it wants on its site. There seemed to be pretty broad agreement during the Supreme Court oral argument on that across the justices and across the lawyers. Now, during oral argument, there was a debate about whether you label that censorship or content moderation, but it's definitely a decision about what to promote, what to de-emphasize, and what to keep out altogether. And those choices, those decisions are matters of expression. In the Florida law, the government is trying to limit or prevent that expression of Facebook's values. And that's the state action that gives Facebook the protection of the First Amendment and gives the Facebook user no recourse except to go elsewhere to express himself. Now, there's a lot more to this case that has to do with the procedural posture of the case of what arguments were made in the lower court and what arguments were not made and how much the facts were developed in the lower court. There was uh, stuff about whether this was a facial challenge to the law or an as-implied challenge. Now, a facial challenge is a challenge to the whole law, and an as-applied challenge is a complaint about how the law worked in a particular case. So it could be that this preliminary injunction is lifted and the law is allowed to go into effect for these technical reasons. But it also seemed clear that even if that happened, even if the preliminary injunction were lifted and the law was allowed to go into effect, the question of whether Facebook and the like can prohibit a specific post will be right back before the Supreme Court. Because these companies would have to radically revamp its services to allow pretty much everything to be said if this law were to go into effect. Even Twitter, which Elon Musk wants to be a free speech oasis, has content moderation. Go on Twitter and you will see notes that correct certain posts that are not altogether true. All of these social media apps have content moderation, and none of them want Nazi posts next to the ads they're running. So sooner or later, the case will come back to Facebook's First Amendment rights, which just about everybody seemed to acknowledge during the oral argument. Now, on the other hand, there appear to be parts of this Florida law that will survive. So maybe Facebook and YouTube can exercise this editorial judgment about content. But what about an email provider like Gmail or a telephone company like Verizon? Maybe Verizon doesn't want racist conversations to be taking place over its phone lines and says that white naturalists cannot get phone service. The Florida law would prevent companies like that, like Verizon, who are termed common carriers, from discriminating against the white nationalists, against customers based on their viewpoints. The Florida law would prevent Gmail from denying service to users based on their viewpoints. Or what about Uber denying access to libertarians, because they don't like libertarians, from getting a ride on one of their cars? The Florida law would prevent that too. And on that score, that kind of viewpoint discrimination exercised by common carriers, the telephone companies, the Ubers, the email providers, the justices and the lawyers seem much more open to saying that the Florida law would be okay to prevent that kind of viewpoint discrimination. So Florida might end up getting a partial win for its law. But was that what they cared about in meaning the legislature, the Florida legislature, the conservatives? Were these conservatives worried about Donald Trump not getting a ride on Uber or not getting broadband service for his home from Comcast 
Obviously not. They wanted to prevent someone like Donald Trump from ever getting banned again from a social media app like Twitter and to prevent people from getting booted from Facebook for spreading things like anti-vaccine propaganda. Now, in the end, the Supremes are unlikely to give the conservatives what they wanted, which was to make Facebook and Twitter act as if they were the government and the First Amendment applied to them. In other words, to make these online platforms as free from restriction as the sidewalk in a public park. That's what they wanted. That's what these conservatives wanted. But they are not going to get it because the First Amendment, instead of restricting Facebook, empowers Facebook to make its own decisions about the vast form it has created for people to express themselves. Now, some liberals and conservatives, for very different reasons, have become disenchanted with the First Amendment. The First Amendment, enacted to pro protect free speech, actually conflicts with free speech values in quite a few cases. You might wonder how we got here. It all comes back to the state action I told you about earlier. The Constitution is all about tying the hands of the government. The Constitution is really effective, for example, in preventing the government from taking all your private online information. But the Constitution will do nothing to prevent Google from vacuuming up all that information for its own purposes. The Constitution, through the Due Process Clause, prevents the government from treating you unfairly. You need notice and an opportunity to be heard before the government can make you pay something as minor as a speeding ticket. But the Constitution does not prevent your private employer from blaming you for something that wasn't your fault and not giving you a chance to tell your side of the story. Now, our Constitution was made in 1787, and the power the founders feared was the government, not private companies. So much of the Constitution was written to address some of the specific concerns about what the British government had done during colonial times. Big companies, rich individuals like John Hancock, they were considered victims of the government, not people or entities that ordinary people had to fear or be protected from. And there was nothing on the scale of Google or Amazon. In 1776, free speech meant distributing pamphlets, giving speeches, or talking to people in taverns. All you needed was for the government to stay out of your way. Now, free speech, in a practical sense, means speaking online, on platforms that have reach. This podcast, for example, would be pointless without the infrastructure of private companies like YouTube and Podbean and the internet service providers making the dissemination of what I'm saying right now possible. For now, that means that the First Amendment rights of big platforms will continue to shape our debates in the United States. And if you don't like it, well, you can amend the First Amendment to make it more in line with the laws of European countries, which recognize that free speech values can be undermined by private companies, not bound by the First Amendment. It was interesting, for example, that European leaders like Angela Merkel, who were no fans of Donald Trump, were taken aback when Twitter and Facebook decided to ban Trump. They were aghast that private companies, not subject to the democratic processes, could make a decision like that. But that's Europe, not the USA. And until we get a huge supermajority to change an amendment, as beloved as the First Amendment, we will have an hands-off approach by the government to public debate and a hands-on approach by the private companies that provide the important forums where that debate occurs. That's it for today. You can find the podcast on Twitter at Law of the Case Pod 
on Facebook, on YouTube, and you can email the show at lawofthecase at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Alex Grant for the Law of the Case podcast.